Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with one of my oldest and dearest friends of 22 years, Amy Apolity. Amy is a yoga teacher, she's an author, she's an earth activist, she's a teacher of teachers, and she is the founder of 90 Monkeys, which is a professional development school for yoga teachers. She's also a featured teacher on Glow.com, or Glow Sisters, and she's the co-author of The Art and Business of Teaching Yoga, which has become a staple in trainings worldwide, which is very exciting to me. Amy has made it her business to refine how yoga teachers are educated after they have had their initial education. She also is the purveyor of a 500 hour training that she offers in Boulder, in Ireland, in Korea this year. Um, it's probably the most comprehensive teacher training and I am so happy to be able to recommend this work to anyone who's interested in a yoga teacher training, whether or not you want to teach in the future, this is a definitively perfect training for you. Mm. Um, so Amy, welcome. Thank you. It's always so good to be with you mm. in our little New York visit. I know it's my favorite. <laughs> Anytime Amy comes to town, she shows up at my apartment. Sometimes she brings her laptop. Usually she brings some sort of tremendously delectable edible treat of not edibles with drugs you silly <laughs> edible food <laughs> really <laughs> good food that ship has sailed um she <laughs> which is so awesome by the way it's the best part about me i think now I, it's can i just say you may i will listen you've been my friend for so long and when you went sober you became my friend all over again oh, in such an exquisite way. That's beautiful. I found you again. Oh, that's beautiful. Drinking that in. Go on. Oh, <laughs> just drinking that in. I want to talk a little bit about leadership, about mentorship, and just sort of building community. I think that's something you do really well, and it's one of the basic tenets of the 90 Monkeys program. So first, with regards to our, let's say, origin, we met in 1997 or 8. We were both at Om Yoga with Cindy Lee. I was just entering into my teacher training. Amy had just finished the first round of Cindy's teacher training at that space. <laughs> and we were children, <laughs> straight up, little beautiful babies. We stayed friends. We uh, were sort of mirroring each other. And as you pointed out earlier, we came up in yoga when there was no yoga around. There were four studios in New York City, maybe. Cindy was the fourth one. There was no Sting doing yoga and, and Willem Dafoe and Moby and Madonna, Madonna <laughs> and all the people that started doing yoga that created this massive burst of energy in the yoga space. And suddenly we went from, you know, there's no work at all to, oh my God, there's lots of work. And then it proceeded forward in the early 2000s into so many teacher trainings that suddenly we had too many teachers and not enough work. And this, I'll let you talk about it, but this is really where the 90 Monkeys program was born. It started out as 90 minute, what was it called? I actually created, from that time in New York, when all the teachers were coming out of our teacher trainings at Vera Yoga, right. actually Elena's studio, Right. I was heartbroken when they couldn't get gigs, they couldn't get jobs, and I started going into overdrive to study 
how do I help? How do I help people, these teachers get jobs and stand out? How do I help them make their classes events instead of ho-hum yoga like everybody else? That put me into overdrive studying marketing, studying personal finances, money management, all the things that yoga teachers don't learn in teacher trainings. Right. How to survive, how to put food on the table, how to live a lifestyle of a yogi, which isn't cheap. We eat organic and we like to give to charity. We take <laughs> so, care of our body. Yeah, and put our kids through college just like anybody else. And so I studied that as much as I studied the Bhagavad Gita and the sutras and put together a course called 90 Minutes to Change the World, which then became 90 Monkeys Got because it. we like monkeys. Because monkeys are cute. Monkeys are cute. And there's an army of them in the Ramayana. Oh. And so we wanted to connect to that and think right. of this idea that yoga teachers are an, a yoga army. We're an mm. army of people trying to make the world a better place. Peacemakers. Yeah. And Lord, do we need that now? Lord, please. Um, your leadership shines in that whole arena. And I think for people who are just coming up as teachers, even if you've had a previous 200-hour training, it's worth it to look into 90 Monkeys because the quality of your understanding of marketing as a tool that helps of the business side of yoga, how to be smart about what you're asking for in terms of your pay, how to be responsible with your boundaries. All of these things are, are the subtleties that very few trainings can offer well. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of respect for that. Um, and we've talked a lot. We had a, a, a really beautiful interview with Megan Rabbit in Yoga Journal. Mm -hmm. I'll try and link it in the show notes, actually, uh, regarding mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I thought it might be interesting to touch on that here because I do feel like it's a critical aspect of where we've evolved as a community now. What does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. How do you work with it? Is it paid? Is it unpaid? What, what's mentorship to you? Mentorship. To me, I mean, I think back to my own history of being mentored and I had this burning desire to learn everything that my teacher knew. And that meant being next to him, being with him as much as possible. Um, all the mentors I've had, it's about time. It's mm -hmm. really about like not checking off a box like, oh, I did their training, but going like, how much time can I spend with this human and let me make it massive the amount of time that I spend massive and consistent, not just one time check a box. And that, that taught me in a way that I can never even imagine if mm. I had just gone to trainings. And so we actually have a program for it. It's called on the road. And once someone has taken certain modules in our 500 hour program, for example, they are eligible then to come on the road and be an assistant in our classes. So there's that level of mentorship where it's like being in the moment with the yoga, seeing how the teacher handles the students in the room in the moment. A training is a sort of fabricated environment where you do peer teaching and you go off with another teacher and teach them. But when you see somebody who's having a knee issue in Ardha Bekasana, and how the teacher handles that, then you know what to do next when mm. you're when you were faced with that same challenge right. with a student. So I see, you know, pure yoga mentorship that way in terms of asana. But then of course there's coaching, there's mentorship on so many levels with the personal work that yoga teachers need to do on themselves in order to to teach in a mature way, in order to hold space for a group there's that personal transformation. And I know both of us have done work with the Handel method and I've done coaching, but I feel like my mentors at that time radically changed my view on the world, how I organize my life, all that stuff. And I feel like that's another area where yoga teachers can, can mature as teachers, as leaders uh, and in holding space for groups, mm. it's, it's imperative. And I know it's not yoga, but good yoga means you find transformation in all, all areas of life, not just on the mat or on the cushion. 
Like right. Good yoga. It's like, it's why I go to the gym. Right. You know, it's not <laughs> like that's good yoga to me mm. is because I'm seeking where do, you know, where do I need to, um, to make the best version of myself? What area do I need to pursue to make the best version of myself? Because, in, you know, yoga for me is about service. Right. It is for you about service for real. So if I'm feeling good in my body, if I'm feeling organized in my home, if I'm, my finances are managed well, like I'm a good yoga teacher. Mm. It isn't that I've done tons of yoga or I've done tons of yoga mentorship. So I see mentorship multifaceted, I suppose. Okay. And I did have a yoga mentor. Yes. You did? Yes. Who was it? Well, it was John. I see. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Reference is to John Friend, who is the yeah. founder of Anusara, which is kind of where we came up, both of us. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to take a little commercial break and say, I completely, we completely honor our time in Anusara Yoga. For those of you that don't know, Anusara was a tradition that had a very short lifespan and a very long wingspan, <clears throat> broad wingspan. A lot of us who came up in Anusara have gone on to create really beautiful, meaningful, potent ripples in the yoga world, I feel. Not being self-congratulatory, just being factual. When I think of Christina Sell and Darren Rhodes and you and Noah Maze and uh, Desiree. Desiree Rumbaugh. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, who am I missing? Everyone. Everyone. Mark Holtzman. Mark Holtzman, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Sienna. Mm-hmm. So many. I mean, I have to go on. I can't go on. There are so many of us. We had a really solid education. And even though the entire sort of construct of the thing got so big that it burst, let's say there were breaches of integrity, all sorts of things happened. It's human. (laughs) We're so human. But we landed in really good Mm -hmm. places, all of us. And I feel very comfortable with how it all netted out in the end. And also, it's like there's never just one teacher. Like the teacher is the community. Mm -hmm. And so we taught each other. We did. I think of how much I learned from you, you know, even in the Vera Yoga days about Mm. not being a brat, not being so invested in things. (laughs) All of us learn from each other, though. Yeah. It's that, I mean, that's what makes us who we are today is that that we had each other. Yeah. And just to close that loop, um, I think where we all ended up from that place, having learned what we learned, having faced what we faced, became a real good foundation for a lot of the Mm -hmm. yoga that's being taught today. Yeah. And, And the people that were in that, movement if you want to call it that they care so much it's true he did raise us up to care greatly about the quality of our work and the world and the world what's happening in the world yeah 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 if you ever listen to this john friend thanks really thank you so the future of yoga Tell me about what you see. I have some ideas, but I, I would really rather hear yours, <laughs> frankly. I want to hear yours. <laughs> I, I see it as um, a pendulum. So it's, I feel it's swung pretty far into a kind of people go to class mm. and they breathe and stretch and do a little sequence. Maybe there's music playing, maybe there's not. Um, and I don't necessarily know if I interviewed everyone after class, what is yoga or how do you see yoga in your life? They could say more than, well, I go to class three times a week and that's about it. And where I see the pendulum swinging is to this place where yoga teachers actually are reminding their students in these classes that they go to what yoga can give them and how yoga can transform them and how yoga can be a vehicle for them to serve and make a difference in the world and in their families and in their lives because it's a practice, not an activity. Hmm. And so I see a pendulum swinging toward, toward mentorship where because young 
yoga teachers are kind of getting under the older teacher's wing, or it doesn't have to be an older teacher, but someone who's been doing it for a while. By the way, we're the older teachers now. We kind of are. Yeah. But get under the wing so that there is that maturity to then bring forth a yoga teacher that responsibly gives back to yoga what it's given to them, which is transformation, which is maturity, which is self-inquiry, which is that it's a practice. It's not an activity. Mm -hmm. And then I see our industry from, you know, here's the, the business part of me, but I see our industry really improving because retreats will do better. Because why would you go on a yoga retreat if you think yoga is an activity like, like Pilates? Right. Nothing against Pilates. No, but I love yoga's Pilates. yoga's just more complex. Yoga just has a deep, it has like a little bit more stuff going on. It's spiritual and it's historical and it's philosophical and it has a lot besides the physical. So I see retreats doing better. I see... Uh, festivals and conferences being more generously attended or abundantly attended. Because we went through a period where that was like enormous, but, massive, right. and now it's sort of like waning a bit. Yeah, like I, you ask the average yoga te or yoga student, like, would you go on a yoga retreat? Well, why? You know, because cause you wouldn't go on a, a step aerobics class retreat. Right. So if yoga is only physical and teachers aren't bringing in some of the like a theme even to a class, no, something no. to a nugget for our students to contemplate, right. then it is purely physical. Right. So that's where I see it. And I, I get excited for one, yoga teachers to get themselves trained really well and, and pursue training because, because of studentship. You're always a student mm. getting under the wing so that they're teaching extraordinarily well because I feel like that's the best way to learn is when you're under the wing. Meaning just in the presence of your teacher, watching the, your teacher in real in time. In real time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, that responsibility of giving a class theme, making it about more than the physical, I think is going to change the industry from a financial standpoint, like from how many people are embracing yoga as a full practice, not just a thing that they go to. And if you're a teacher and you're listening to this, do us a favor and keep your talk at the beginning of class to under five minutes. That's all. Yeah. Three. Three is best. But have it have meaning. Yeah. That's it. Meaning to you and relevance to the people there. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be a story about you. It Boom. should be a relevant story to mm -hmm. the people there. Something universally potent. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm glad we got that. I think next I would love to talk about your your answers to the three questions that I always ask everyone. I love these questions. Mm -hmm. The first being, what in your life or space needs healing right now? I think for me, I'm constantly working on embracing the season that I'm in in my life. Mm. So whether that's, where I'm at professionally, but mostly where I'm at in my age. Got it. So this means physiologically, emotionally, mentally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're both the same age now. We're almost 50 years old. Yeah. Feels like such an honor. Yeah, and I feel as though I have two feet in my 30s. Yes. Or early forties yes. and two feet, like I'm 80 years old mm. and I'm, and it's been that way for about five years. I think we're like in the puberty of our <laughs> adulthood. Puberty of elderhood. Yeah. And so that's a, it's a constant touching in and awkwardness of that. It feels awkward. And so. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I'm embracing it as best I can. You also. I, for those of you that have never met Amy, look at her picture because she lo <laughs> still looks like she's in her 30s. So does Elena. So, no, no. This one's like a real kid, like a kiddo. <laughs> um, the second question is, what's your favorite view? 
Oh, my favorite view is when um, I'm looking into someone's eyes and their eyes are filled with tears. Oh, God bless Jesus. Ah. <laughs> uh. Good Lord. Here I was thinking you were going to tell me you were on some snorkeling trip and some whale went <laughs> that leaping too. up into That's the ocean. That's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, what are we going to do with you? That would be a good view. I actually do like that view. No, that's like really what I thought you were going to say, my ocean <laughs> activist friend. Well, it's the other kind of salt water. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm still stuck on the puberty of elderhood and that's what's making me like feel very touched right now. <laughs> we'll the, have to riff on that one later. We're going to have to. The third, you have to read uh, Come of Age by Stephen Jenkinson. Oh, it's a beautiful book. I'll link it here too. It's um, my dear friend Jenny Ferry who sent me this book. Oh. And it's a case, the subtitle is It's Come of Age. Mm. Stephen Jenkinson, a, a case or the case for elderhood in a time of trouble. Mm. That sounds fabulous. Yeah, goes into the etymology of the word old. Oh, there's oh so, much, so much oh, richness. I can't wait. It's a beautiful book. This is also the thing that I live for about Elena is that we have this constant exchange. Of, oh, my God. Like, get this product and buy this book and do this. You taught me about stasher bags. Oh, God. You've taught me about so many insanely excellent things that enrich my life. I'll be sure to include the links to this on practiceyou.com on the show notes. Totally. Stasher bags are very important. Yeah, sta it's really all about stasher. Very important. You can cook in them. You can store your food in them. They don't get old. You can wash them in the dishwasher. You don't have to have plastic you all over your house. You don't have to have plastic house. anywhere in your house. It's so nice. Okay. The last question. Hmm. What does prayer mean to you? Oh, I love that one. Um, prayer is the way that we have our own unique and distinct, ridiculous relationship with the universe. Mm. And like how you have these little conversations with the divine about what you'd like. But I think it's so important to have that conversation be your own yeah so like if you talk to god like dude hook me up with a parking spot like that's how you talk to him or her or right. whoever whomever but you have to have your own little authentic voice and conversation and then wow you can manifest almost anything and so don't make it anyone else's voice no i see and you can find that voice by getting quiet and meditating and, um, and, and keeping the dialogue open. Yeah. You but I a, love how unique the voices can be. It's fun to say, dude, I would live for a parking spot right now. Hook me up, yo. Or do that. I could really use some loving touches right now from my child. Can you please warm him up? You know? Right. Right. I love... Um, That's prayer. I just love the idea that prayer can be literally anything you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And I love hearing everyone's answers. It's, these are great questions. Yeah. The contribution that you've made to the ecology of the teaching, the yoga teaching community is substantial. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, lastly, what you feel your future is in this. Do you feel like you'll be teaching for a long time longer? Do you feel like you're going to pursue other interests? I, I feel like it will be a, a continuation of where I've been, which is like, yes, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm super stoked for those coming up in our training program to take the baton as well. I'm really super into that. Mm. And, um, you know, my other interests are pretty broad and I'm happiest, happiest on a boat, um, doing ocean conservation work. And I'm also really happy 
doing my best to work for a world that is moving away from devastating climate change. So I do see myself getting into the trenches a lot more. I always felt like my activism, it didn't take a back seat to my yoga because I felt like my yoga was my activism, that by being an example, I could affect change. And because yoga has shifted slightly away from uh, having themes, like we talked about, it's become more physical, I feel more of a need to put myself back into the trenches. I see. Of teaching. Not of teaching, of, <clears throat> of oh, activism of, again. Of, I see. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it, got it. Those trenches. Got it. And so I'm actually, yeah, I'm kind of working with how much do I jump back into that versus making the yoga be my activism. And you know what Yoga Rupa says. Sorry to interrupt you. Go for it. He really likes, he's made a distinction, a clear distinction between your activism, your politics, whatever it is, out of the yoga class. Mm hmm and keeping your yoga class about the yoga, the connectivity, mm -hmm. the touching in with the point of peace that is always within you and always at rest. Totally agree. Um, I really found that very refreshing. I heard him say that again recently, and mm -hmm. I, I was reminded of how important that is to me too. I, I go to yoga to teach yoga. I'm not there to talk about anything mm -hmm. else other than you, the student, having a connection with yourself, period. Mm -hmm. Well, and being a role model, I feel like. Mm. Just being yourself when you're teaching can do wonders toward inspiring someone to care more in the world. So that's where my yoga has been activist-y. I see. But then there is this separate work of, you know, my ocean conservation work, politics, whatever it is. But the environment is... It's in a dire state. We have 11 years. That's what I was reading. Yeah. 11 or 12 years. Yeah. And I've known this since I was 20. Yeah. 17, 18. But um, I thought that just teaching was enough. In the last 10 years, I've gotten more into spending some of my time as an activist. Mm. And I've... And as I said, I feel like I'm wanting to amp that up a little bit as I get older. What's your... Um, with what's a combination the of the yoga and the activism, but amping the activism up more. Got it. Mm -hmm. What's the, the top cause that you think of when I ask you to think of what cause you're here for? It's... I know it's the environment. And do you have an organization that you reference? Mm -hmm. There's... um. God, there's so many. It's it's overwhelming. But wildaid.org. Climate change, I feel like I'd need to do a little bit of research on which organizations. No, but if you're... But NRDC really mm -hmm. comes to mind. NRDC.org. Um, yeah, that okay. one really comes to mind. And, and unfortunately, it's more than just organizations at this point for climate change. It really has to do with policy coming from the top, and then it does get political. Right. There. <laughs> like who we vote for. Yeah, you yeah, know? of course. Yeah. Of course. Well. Yeah, Blue Sphere Foundation, Sea Legacy. Blue Sphere Foundation? Sphere, Blue Sphere Blue Foundation. Blue Sphere Foundation. Sea Legacy. clegacy.org. Yeah. Okay. I'll be sure to put these links on yeah. the on the Practice You website where the show notes mm -hmm. live. I love you. I adore you. I want you to come back again. I like keeping them short. You know, this I'm is, always yeah. around. Good. Every time you come, <laughs> you're coming here. Bring um, food. Anything else? Uh, I'll, I'll be sure to link up 90monkeys.com forward slash teacher dash training so that people can look that up. Um, I think we've covered everything else for now, but there'll be more to come with Amy Apolity. Thank you. I love you. I love you.